The topic tonight is holiness, an end time call. I've been doing some research on the word holiness and um, come across a different definition. And I'd like to be sharing that with you and how that links in with the end times. It's based on the studies of the word in Hebrew. And one different way of saying, of the meaning of the word holy in Hebrew is to be exceedingly ready for action. To be exceedingly ready for action. To be at the very height of being absolutely ready for all that is good. You see, when the priests were to serve the Lord, they had to be holy. They had to be set apart for the Lord. And as they were set apart for the Lord, they were ready to do something. It wasn't just um, you know, like a, a nice silver cup that sits on the, on the shelf and it sits there and collects dust. You could say, well, it's, it's, it's pretty and it's, it's, it's holy. But it was actually in use. Uh, and so the priests were to be exceedingly ready. They'd be ready to be used by the Lord. And so there was all this preparation taking place in their lives to clean out things that other people might have in their lives because they were to be <laughs> ready for the Lord's use, ready to serve him. And so holiness prepares us for a purpose. It's not just there to make us look good or look good in God's sight. It's there to, to make us ready to be used by the Lord. The vessels of the temple were made of gold, silver and bronze and would go for an extensive preparation process. And they would be holy for the Lord, but they would be in constant use in the temple. So they weren't just holy, they were in use. And so holiness prepares us to be exceedingly ready for action, to be ready. The priests had to always be ready. They couldn't afford to, to muck around because they had a task to do. And if they, they missed it, they were no longer ready to do the task God had called them to do. Holiness is for a purpose. One tool the enemy will, will use in, in our lives is he'll use condemnation. Like if we miss it somewhere along the line, he'll use something like that and he'll keep reminding you saying, don't you remember what you did yesterday or the day before or the week before? He'll, he'll keep reminding you. And his purpose of doing that is to make sure that you, you are you're reminded of, of your sin, you're reminded of your mistake, and then you are not in that position where you're ready to be used by the Lord. I want to go to 1 John chapter 3. So 1 John chapter 3, verse uh, 20, 21. Verse uh, 21 and 22. Uh, let's, let's read it together. One, two. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now let's do the opposite here. So if our heart is condemning us, and if we are stuck in that, if we're stuck in this feeling of condemnation, then our confidence towards God is zapped. It's gone. And our asking of him and our receiving from him is hindered because of this feeling of condemnation, because we're not feeling that we're in the right, spa- right place with God. If we have, if we're generally, we have messed up, we are not there in that place where we can hear from the Lord, ask and receive from him. We are hindered from approaching him with confidence. Now, of course, we have the good news that, you know, it says that as we confess our sins, we're going to read that too, First John 1 John 1.9. First John 1, verse 9. This is a, such a good verse, and I, I actually I read it to myself every night. Uh, let, let's read it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the good news, of course, is that we can be cleansed. We can be made holy again. And as we confess our sins, he is faithful. And I just love that transition. It's away from our sins and our faults and our follies and we're gift- lifting our eyes up to him and his faithfulness to cleanse us, his faithfulness to restore us and to make us holy again. And so as we confess our sins, as we take it to him, we are restored. If we go back to First John chapter 3, verse 20... Because sometimes as you confess something to the Lord, you'll still feel kind of bad about it. Uh, and uh, 1 John 3.20, let's read together. 
If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. This is such a good verse to stand on. If you're feeling condemned in any way, you have, you have confessed it to the Lord, you have said, oh, I'm sorry, you have repented of it as sin, and you still are feeling kind of bad, take up this verse here and say, Lord, even when my heart condemns me, you are greater than my heart. When I'm feeling this irritating uh, sense of condemnation, you are greater than my heart, and you are faithful to your word. Yes, I have failed. Yes, I have messed up. But you are faithful. You are just. You are faithful to cleanse me of my sin. And so then we can go on to verse 21 that then we have confidence toward God. Then we have confidence to pray. We have confidence to ask and receive from him. And so then having been cleansed, been made holy again, we are able to be used by him despite our past, despite where we've been at. And it is just so good to know that... um, The Lord cleanses us like that. It's not anything we deserve. It is what he does in our lives. Some years back, I was doing a a prayer bulletin for a church. We'd collect prayer points and we'd send them out. And um, it didn't go too well in the sense that not many signed up. We had about three or four people signing up, collecting the notes. It was a big church, so three or four people is not very good. Uh, But uh, people were praying and people would come to us with prayer points. And um, one lady came to me and she said, oh, can you please pray for my son? He's, he's having um, surgery to have a cochlear implant. Now, she had another son who had the same surgery, and when he had that surgery, something went badly wrong. And so he had developed a disability out of that, whatever it was that went wrong. So she was very concerned about her youngest son having the same, the same implant. So she said, please, please pray. So I passed the word on to my band of three or four, I probably prayed for about two seconds myself. Uh, and I don't know if they prayed very much either, maybe two or three seconds as well. Next week, she came back to us all excited, told us that just before the surgery, they did another checkup and her son's hearing was fine. They didn't need to do the implant. And she was just amazed. She was looking at me like I was a saint. You know, well, what did you do? You know, how did you do it? You know, I knew I'd only prayed for two or three seconds. I barely prayed at all. And I don't think there were that many on the list who prayed either. But what I know is that the Lord had cleansed me from my sin some time back. We rewind a year or so. There had been a cleansing process in my life. And I was dealing with some sin issues, confessing it, getting some help in it, praying about it. And then now, here I am a year later, praying a very brief prayer and something dramatic happens. I know it's not me. It's not my power. It's not because I prayed so hard. It is the Lord did something. He answered our prayers and this boy was healed. God wants to use us, and holiness is a requisite, a prerequisite to be used by the Lord. But the good thing is that he is faithful and just as we confess our sins to cleanse us and set us apart for him again so we can be used by him despite where we've been in the past, despite the, the, the mistakes we've made. So holiness is not just there to make us look pretty. It's there for a purpose so we can be used, used by him. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, verse um, 20. Again, we're talking about pure and holy vessels. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 20 and 21. Let's read together. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honour, and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Do you see that there, this sanctified vessel? He is made holy, he is set apart, and now he is ready for every good work. But he's also talking about the not-so-pure vessels. So if you are in a house... Perhaps you've got your, your favourite cup or you've got a nice, uh, a nice decorated cup. It might be especially for visitors or special occasions. You might have other cups that are not so nice uh, and maybe an old dirty bowl and you know, who knows what you're going to use that for. Uh, pretty disgusting stuff. Now, um, the Lord wants us to be those, those holy vessels set apart for him, not just sitting on the shelf, but being cleansed, being pure, being holy and set apart for his good purpose. So holiness is not just about um, being pure, but also about being ready 
to be used by him, being in a state of constantly being ready to be used by him. I um, want us to sing tonight, and we sang uh, this song, Refine as Fire. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, Lord, ready to do your will. And I'd never made the connection between holy and ready to do your will. But there is a connection here. The Lord is calling us to do his will. He's got a plan and purpose for our lives. But the, rec- the prerequisite is holiness, being pure, being cleansed, being set apart for him. Now there is, on the other hand, the vessels of dishonor. And um, I, it's interesting. Let's go to um, Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, verse uh, 17. It's a bit of a a powerful verse. Um, Let's read it together. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Now, why am I reading this? Um, The thing is, in Hebrew, the word for holiness is kadosh. You you heard that word, kadosh? Um, It's on a song we we sing at times. Kadosh, kadosh. uh, Kadosh is holy in, in Hebrew. But there's another word that is spelt precisely the same in the Hebrew text and you can't tell the difference. And that word is in this verse. It is, uh, it's got, it's pronounced uh, Kadesh or Kadesha, uh, but it's, it's written exactly the same. Uh, and it is then a, a prostitute who's set aside in the temple to false gods. A male or a female prostitute. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that they're set apart for something else. They're set apart for evil. And if you just read quickly through the text, you could actually miss it. If you're reading in the Hebrew, you could miss it. You could wonder, what's the word holy doing in here? Now, the world has a counterfeit holiness. It's got a counterfeit thing that it is doing now. We talk about holiness is about being ready and prepared to do God's will. But here's a person who's ready and prepared to do the will of someone else, the will of another God and the will of a false God. And so that is a false holiness is a false uh, preparedness for something else. So this is a person who's dedicated to evil, often from childhood. And so there are these two kinds of preparation going on. And I believe as we'll, we'll start to focus now into end times, that there will be both kind of things happening as we enter into the end times. The Lord is calling us to be ready for the good works, be holy, be set apart for him. At the same time, the world is being more and more ready and set apart for evil works. Okay, and so there is a, a maturing of both good and evil in the day that we're in. Which Kadosh will our society choose? choose? Will they choose Kadosh or Kadesh? Will they choose holy to the Lord or will they choose holy to some other God? When I was a teenager, I realized I couldn't have both the world and the ways of the Lord, and I had to choose. I was being torn between the ways of the world and the ways of God. It was kind of, where do I go? Uh, and uh, ultimately... I knew the touch of the Lord's presence kept, kept drawing me back. Despite the issues in my life, I kept saying, Lord, I want your presence. I'm hungry and thirsty for you. I had a touch when I was 12, 13 years old, and I wanted to have more of the Lord's presence. So yes, the world was tempting with all its ways, but I said, Lord, I want you. And so I was choosing, saying, Lord, I want to be holy. I want to be set apart for you. Cleanse me from all sin and make me holy unto you. I don't want to be like this person is versus set apart for something else. I want to be set apart for you. I want to be ready to do your will. End times. The church has been talking about the the return of Jesus for 2,000 years and many might think he's still far off somewhere, a long way away. But I believe that it could be sooner than many realize. And so I'm just bringing this up very briefly just to say that I believe we are living in times where the scriptures are are being fulfilled. We're living in times that are not like uh, the times the church has seen for the past 2,000 years. And so there is therefore a, a challenge for us to live in a different way. There's a challenge for us then to be aware of the big picture and say, Lord, what are you doing? What do you want us to do as a result? I believe, that, um, I believe that the enemy knows what's going on. He knows a bit that his time is running short. 
And so he is working very quick and over time to try to influence the next generation. Like we've been talking about and praying about the Victorian education system and how they've taken the RE out of schools and replaced it with um, programs that, you know, safe schools program and so on that's advocating um, lesbian, gay, sec- gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex uh, relationships and so on. I believe that they're trying to erode the moral boundaries. Now, what I mean by that is that if you suddenly had the idea that um, you should go and rob the bank, you'd know straight away that, no, that's not a good thing to do, maybe I'll be caught, etc. And so you'll just kick that thought out of your mind and say, nah, forget it. You know, you're going to focus on it. You know it's wrong, and straight away your defense is up, bang, no, I'm not going to touch that. It's not even a temptation, really. You, you know it's just not the thing. But what they're trying to do here is to remove these kind of boundaries. So you no longer know that something is necessarily wrong. And so you don't immediately say no to it. So as young people, as we're growing up, there are different thoughts that will go through our minds. Some will be good, some will not be good. And their programs are there to try to remove those boundaries. You'll say, well, if I had this thought about my same-sex friend, then maybe I am gay or whatever. They're trying to remove the boundaries in order to bring people into a different kind of way of living. So the enemy is trying to prepare people for a different lifestyle and he's working overtime to do so. They're trying to do it through hook and crook, uh, through the legal system. They're not actually telling us that this is what they want to do. They're just passing laws, saying this is it, and you're not allowed to protest. They're in a hurry to influence the next generation. Lenin uh, was the man who who founded the Soviet Union and he said, give me one generation of youth and I will change the world. He wanted to influence the young people, he knew the power of it. And so we see an acceleration of evil in our generation. We see the enemy has a plan and he knows his time is short and so he's trying very hard to influence the young people, to prepare them to do his work. Does the church know the time we're in? Is the church concentrating her efforts on what she should be doing at this time? Are we raising up the next generation to be holy and set apart for the Lord, to be ready to do his will? You see, it's not just about coming to church and being good looking. It's about being ready to do God's will. Like we talked about the air conditioner being plugged in. It's this holiness of being set apart for the Lord and now can be used by him wherever you are. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, a lot of churches did a lot of teaching on, on Bible prophecy and they would advertise it in the newspapers and if you checked on uh, a phone listing directory, they would tell you what, what beliefs they had about Bible prophecy would be in the, in the, in the yellow pages. Uh, they would say, oh, we believe that Jesus is coming now or there's a tribulation first, etc. They, they, they would list their, their beliefs about it in the phone directory. It was important to them. They talked about it a lot. As you sing some of the old songs, you'll, you'll hear that emphasis in the songs about when he comes, uh, you know, about being ready for his coming. Somehow, there's been a shift away from that focus, and so the church isn't so much talking about it. The songs, many of them, are not so much about it, just about, Lord, I love you, and you love me, and we're going to be together. And that's good, but there is a big picture, and that big picture motivates us to follow the Lord. That big picture motivates us to get ready. You know, if your parents are away for a weekend or something and they leave, leave you to the house, uh, if you're like me, it might get a little bit messy by the time the parents are due to come back. And there's a few different things you should have done before they arrive, and you'll sort of postpone it a bit until the last minute, and then, then you'll take care of it. And so it's really good then when the parents give you a little bit of notice that, oh, I'm on my way. You know, they call you from interstate saying, yes, I'll, I'll be home in two hours. And then you've got time to panic, you know, time to clean up, time to get everything ready. And so we know then the signs that of the parents coming. We know what's going on and we act accordingly. I believe God is showing us signs regarding what's happening in the world today. In order that we will be ready, we'll act accordingly. We'll say, hey, uh-oh, I don't have a lot of time here. I'm going to clean up. I'm going to tidy up. I'm going to get things out of the way quick, smart. I need to make sure I'm ready. we we'll go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. It 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse uh, 19. Uh, let's read it together. Uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So we have a sure word of prophecy. The words that God has spoken in the scriptures, some of it was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. But likewise, we then know that what remains will be fulfilled as we get closer to the time of his second coming. And it says here that as we take heed to those prophecies, as we remember them, there will be a light in our path, in, on our path. There will be a light in a dark place. It will help us to know what we should do in that time. The early disciples, they lived ready. They were prepared. They believed that the Lord will return soon in their lifetimes. And so they lived all out for that. They didn't live for house, career, wife, marriage, and so on, important as it is. They lived for something even higher. They knew that their time could be short, and they lived all out for the Lord. I believe that time is getting closer again, that time when the Lord's coming is drawing near. And so it becomes then a a change of priorities, a change of lifestyle, and saying, Lord, I want to be holy. I want to be set apart to do your will. I want to do what you call me to do now. Some people will postpone it, say, Lord, I'll I'll serve you later. Um, I met a a young Chinese businessman and uh, he seemed to know a lot about the Bible. But uh, he said he didn't want to be a Christian now because he thought that it's really hard to be a Christian and be in business. Uh, you know, he said, you have to tell a few lies in business, and, and you know, if you're a Christian, you can't do that. So his plan then was to, to do well in business, tell a few lies, and so on. Uh, and then once he's got a house or two, uh, once he's doing very well, then he'll become a Christian. I don't think that's the way to go. I think he's putting it back to front. Uh, and uh, last I spoke to him, he was in hospital with a broken leg, and his business was not going too well, it was shutting down. His priorities were back to front. Uh, And I believe the Lord is calling us to live a different way. He's calling us to live for him now, not put it off for another day or another time. And so holiness is part of this end time call of being ready to serve the Lord. Let's go to Matthew um, 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, um, it's interesting that a lot of Jesus' teaching is about the end times. A lot of it. His focus is on getting ready, be ready, make sure you don't slumber or sleep, make sure you look after talents they're given you. He's teaching a lot on it. In other words, it's important. In other words, it is there for our learning, and there is a lesson for us to learn there and to live accordingly. And he brings out a story here, Matthew 25, about these ten virgins. Uh, let's, okay, verse 1 to, to um, 13. All right, let's, let's read together. That's right. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. I think it's a scary story uh, because here we've got people who are waiting and uh, ten virgins. In other words, they are set apart. They are holy and set apart, so to speak. But 
what happens along the way is that five of them are prepared, five of them are ready, and five of them are not. And the real key verse is verse 10, where it says that those who were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. God is calling us to be, to be ready, to be holy, to be set apart for him, to be ready to do the work he's called us to do and to be ready for when he comes. We have to choose. Choose what path we're on and we pray, of course, for our community that they will make the right choices, that our friends will make the right choices, that they'll be wholly set apart for the Lord. I believe that as we're getting more towards the time of the Lord's coming, there will be, a, a, um, there will be more evil in society and there'll be more good as well. And so both things are rising up and we, have to, we can't be in the middle ground. We have to choose which way we're going to go. Let's go to Revelation 19, verse 7. And that's the good news. Here, uh, actually from verse 6, from verse 6, 19, verse 6 to 7, uh, we just get the context of this massive number of people shouting something very important. So let's read it together. Verse 6. And I heard as it was the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. See, she has made herself ready. And there's a shout of triumph from the heavens, saying, Finally she is ready, finally she is prepared. God is waiting for holy and pure bride to be ready for his coming. And when that happens, the heavens will shout out saying, finally, finally she's ready, finally. I believe the Lord will be the one doing that, preparing us and, and so on. But we have a role to play in being set apart for him, living for him now. Holiness and end times go together. Uh, and it is a call for us to, uh, to be ready to do his will. Let's end, end with uh, Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> Hebrews 12 t- tells us a sad story. Uh, Hebrews 12 verse 16. It's talking about a young, young man who had tremendous promise. Let's read verse uh, 16 and 17. It says, uh, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau, the grandson of Abraham, grew up in the household with Abraham. He would have heard the stories firsthand from Abraham about how God had led him, how God had a promise for him, how God had a specific purpose and plan for him. Yet Esau couldn't care less. Uh, and uh, the time come when he, he was really hungry, and he knew that all the promises of Abraham were bestowed on him. He was that next chain in the link. But for him, it just didn't seem real, this stuff about the promises of God. For him, what was really real was what he, he needed, what he could feel here and now. And so he was hungry, and he could smell the lentil soup. Now, apparently, the lentil soup in the Middle East is really, really good. Okay, so you smell it, you go, ooh, that's good. He's hungry, it smells nice. And so he throws behind him this tremendous promise of God, tremendous destiny on his life, and he says, give me that soup. And so Jacob, of course, tricks him and says, okay, I'll give you the soup if you promise to give me your blessing. And he says, yeah, sure, what's good is a blessing for me? I want that soup. I want it now. And it says that later on, he wanted to get the blessing back, and it was too late. And that's a challenge. Uh, you know, the Lord is merciful, and I know in my own life so many times where I've missed it, he's been merciful. He's forgiven me. He's cleansed me. He's forgiven me more than I'll forgive myself. I'll say, okay, Enoch, you've got only five more chances, only three more chances, and that's it. Uh, whereas God has forgiven me more than I would expect. He's been gracious to me as I come to him. But there comes a time when the time's up. And that's what Esau found out. He found out that he had left it too long. He had chosen his nice piece of meat, his nice piece of lentil soup, And it was too late. The world is being tempted to go after the lentil soup. The world's being tempted to go after what will satisfy the flesh. That's what they're being taught, is if you feel like it, go for it, it's good. But God is calling us to go in a different way, 
to say, okay, Lord, what, is, what do you want for my life? What's your way? What's your, your purpose for me? I want to be set apart to do your will, to follow you. And as we do, we are then choosing that good portion, choosing an inheritance that's so much better than what we can possibly get here on earth. That short, passing pleasure of the lentil soup will disappear in a few moments. But what the Lord has is so much better and will last forever. The early disciples, they sacrificed greatly to follow the Lord. And we are also called, likewise, to take up our cross, say no to the flesh, say no to the desires of the world, and say, Lord, I want to follow you. End times is a time for holiness, a time to be prepared like never before. Say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be useful in your hands. I don't want to be living my own way anymore. I want to live for you. And I want you to be able to use me. Because the Lord has a purpose for each and every one of us. He's fashioned us in a certain way and he wants to use us. But it comes from that foundation of, saying, of getting cleansed first. And so as we're having the time of worship tonight and just the Lord's presence was here, I believe the Lord is wanting to, to bring us back to that river of his presence and bring us back to the place of, of holiness and purity before him that he might move in our lives. So we could just take a quiet moment and just, just pray um, about these things. So if the Lord's been showing you something in your life that's not quite the way it should be, Take the opportunity to just to, to bring it to the Lord. You see, that's more important than anything else, is that you are ready for Him. It's more important than anything else that you are set apart for Him. If there's one thing that I could give you, but I can't, it is to be ready for His coming. But only you can make that decision. Only you you see those ten virgins, they were all r waiting for the bridegroom. They must have all, in a sense, been a picture of believers, but not all of them made it. Some of them fell short. I've been in church for a while and I've seen people come and go. I've seen people start very well and they haven't finished. And I've seen others that I didn't expect to go anywhere who've grown and become strong in the Lord. The choice comes back to you as an individual. Which way will you choose? Will you be holy, set apart for the Lord, or will you be set apart for the world? And what about me? I have a choice too. Lord, we commit to you, Lord, anything in our lives right now that is hindering us, Lord, from following you fully. Anything, Lord, is holding us back, Lord God, so we cannot fully serve you the way you call us to. We take it to you right now. We ask for your cleansing of it. That you'll cleanse it away. That you'll cleanse it in your precious blood. Lord, we commit it to you. We confess where we have failed you. And we ask you, Lord, to cleanse us from it, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as we do, you are faithful to cleanse us. You are faithful and just. But you're calling us to live a new way. You're calling us to live holy, set apart for you. You are a holy, consuming fire. And Lord, there is a time for us to be ready. And you're giving us plenty of time, but suddenly the time is up. And Lord, we want to be ready right now. Just pour it out to the Lord, whatever it is. And Lord, we want you. We want you. We want to live for you. Cleanse us, Lord, we pray. Cleanse your people, Lord, we pray. I thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed for us to take away our shortcomings, to take away our sin and to make us holy again. And Lord, as we're here on holy ground, cleanse us, we pray, of anything not of you and set us apart for you again. Lord, every revival has begun from a place of consecration to you, a place of holiness, Lord, to you. And Lord, we want to be set apart for you. Come with your spirit in our midst. Come with your fire in our lives. Purify us, Holy Spirit. Purify us, Holy Spirit. Purify us. Purify us. 